It seems like yesterday that Japanese director Makoto Shinkai caught the world by storm with the release of Your Name, which quickly became the highest grossing anime film of all time at the time of its release and put his name on the map as a legendary filmmaker close to that of Miyazaki himself. However, the history of this man as a filmmaker dates many, many years back, with a total of six movies made since 2004. I don't think any of his movies have gone completely unappreciated over the years, as many of them have a cult following on social media, but for a person as talented as Shinkai, cult following just won't cut it. I don't think I can really change that with this video, but I can at least try to give the movie some justice with a comprehensive ranking, which seems to be a bit of a recurring theme on this channel. Just as a small warning, I'm not gonna be singing my praises during this entire video. Like any artist, Shinkai's story is one of successes and mistakes, and saying that is not a diminishment. I love the man's work as much as I appreciate his ability to evolve past certain shortcomings. With all that said, here's every Makoto Shinkai film from worst to best. Open your eyes. The place promised in our early days. This is probably the easiest placement on this list. This movie with a title that I will not repeat for obvious reasons is Shinkai's first. And as such, it's a mess. And I think few people aren't with me on this one. We follow the story of two boys who bond with a girl in the middle of a conflict between the two halves of Japan, in an alternate world where such separation exists. The girl, however, ends up mysteriously disappearing, and the two boys part ways, allying with different sides. Saying it out loud, it sounds like a really heartwarming story about love and war, and there are areas of this film that absolutely show that. When you see the three friends playing around on a bright sunny day, talking about building a plane and flying off to the tower when they grow up, it's truly touching, which makes the sudden grim turn of events much more sour. When the boys fight over their differences, only to eventually decide to reunite in order to help their childhood friend, you feel the drama, you care for these characters' emotions, and you want them to do this impossible mission and wake up the girl because the feeling of reconnecting to a part of you that you thought was long gone is one that everyone can relate to. But, of course, I suppose this believable and sweet human conflict just wasn't enough. This it's a sci-fi story. It's got weird tech and strange concepts and a lot of scientific mumbo-jumbo. why None of this adds anything. What does the movie gain by letting me know how this weird tower extra-dimensional chain reaction thingy works? If you were gonna do something interesting with it, fine, but the main characters just fly to the tower, wake the girl up and blow it up. You could have cut down so much screen time, or better yet, use it to flesh out your characters more. Because really, these characters are kinda undercooked. Have you noticed how I'm not even referring to them by name? I, I literally don't know them. Yes, I, I could look them up, but I don't really feel like it. Sure, Japanese names are very foreign, but I know them in almost every other Shinkai movie. The movie doesn't let me care about these characters because during over half the movie they're incredibly passive to allow the sci-fi stuff to explain itself. The world building isn't that much better either, like, you really didn't need so many unnecessary details about what these no-face governments are doing, let alone via boring radio transmissions. The animation is probably fine for the time, but for today's standards I'm not too fond of the overly static scenes that plague it, probably due to budget limitations, but still. Overall, I think this is a below average movie with a lot of heart, you can't really take that away from the guy and his team. For his worst endeavor, this could be considerably weaker, and from here we're gonna be going considerably higher in quality. <laughs> Now it's time for my most divisive placement on the entire video. 5 centimeters per second. Hear me out. This movie has been praised to the stratosphere for being a calm, melancholic tale of two people falling in love and accepting the fact that they have to drift away, using every second of its short runtime to put you on the shoes of these sad characters on their quest to be happy again. And I think that is true. This movie is as gorgeous on the outside as it is beautiful on the inside, with some of the strongest visual theming I've ever seen in a movie. The fact that it's divided into three periods of time of the life of protagonist Takaki gives the movie a bit of an eternal feel, like you're not just watching an impactful event on his life, you're watching his life and how every event affects him for years and years. It is a bold move by Shinkai, much more so being his second film, and I cannot ever downplay that. 
but I just think, and this is my opinion, that this movie is a bit too unambitious. Despite what I've just said about the movie being bold in some aspects, I do perceive some chunks of the movie as not trying hard enough. I wish I could see more of Takaki and Akari's relationship before their separation, get a better feel about their personalities and chemistry. The movie tells us some important highlights, but I struggle to emotionally invest in them. The train scene is visually impressive and charged with melancholy, but I fail to feel it because I don't feel that much for Takaki at this point. If the scene was a couple minutes long, I wouldn't even care, but it goes on for way too long and is filled with just monologues about what Takaki is thinking about. A bit of a theme in this movie, the second episode feels like a narration of a pretty book, not a single drop of nuance or subtlety when the movie wants to communicate its message and the final episode doesn't fare much better in this aspect. Despite the initial lack of development the main couple have, I'd say they pulled a nice job by the end of the first chapter, and the romance in the second chapter, while awkward, is fine. But by the third chapter, it becomes a bit much, with an adult Takaki still longing and mourning his past love so many years after the fact, with such an intensity to break up with his girlfriend. It's a bit hard to relate to that. The final scene with the train doesn't have the problem of subtlety and is successful at wrapping up the main idea of the movie and yeah, this scene is superb. Combine that with the powerful A and B that follows and it's hard to go out of the experience feeling disappointed. But I did. I don't really feel special about not clicking with a movie so many people love, but what you gonna do? I think this movie is decent for what it is, and that it could have been so much better. And I believe Shinkai agreed with me on some level because one of his future movies is everything 5 centimeters per second wanted to be, and more. Oh hey, that's the movie I was referring to, The Garden of Words is a great film, no ifs or buts. It's number 4 because the next ones are just that good. I don't really have many complaints here. In just 40-ish minutes, the shortest runtime on this list, it tells the story of two people meeting and bonding, exploring how each character feels both in and outside the moments they share with the other. Ultimately, it's a film about the hardships of life, and how someone else, even a random stranger in the park during a rainy day, can help you go through those tough times. 5 centimeters per second succeeded at being an immensely introspective story about the love of two young people, but for me, it struggled to make me care about the characters and make each individual scene keep my interest. Garden of Words doesn't stumble there. These two characters, Takao and Yukari, meet each other at the beginning of the film. Pretty much every important interaction they have from that moment to the moment they're separated is seen in real time. We get to see every one of their exchanges and how they evolve and accept the other's presence. In that aspect, the movie does not cut corners. Maybe it's in seeing the personal life of Takao in particular that the movie could have done a better job for me. His interactions with Yukari are great, but I didn't really get why he needed her so much. What's his deal with shoemaking and his unpresent mother? The movie clearly makes a case that Takao is in need of better personal relationships, and of course we see him use his shoemaking passion to connect with Yukari, but I didn't think the film made his true feelings on that aspect all that clear. That's about the roughest thing I can say about the movie. On the flip side, Yukari's personal life is incredibly saddening to see, as you can see how she progressively becomes more and more desolate and worsens her living habits. On that end, I've got no critiques. As the movie advances, Takao falls in love with Yukari, so Yukari finds herself pushing Takao away. Which, good grace thank you, I wasn't willing to deal with age gaps today. Takao in response is incredibly frustrated, because in his perspective, that felt like treason to all the time she agreed to spend with him. After all, Yukari spent all those good times with a smile but never really opened up about what she felt. Yukari, however, in a desolate cry, tells him that she needed him to endure all those difficult times she had secretly been through. So although these characters don't really love each other, they made a relationship in order to heal or, like the film puts it, learn to walk again. I think that is beautiful. This whole thing really is Shinkai beauty and probably the movie more reflective of the man's style. I'm not gonna pretend like I'm high over heels over the film, not because it's faulty, but because its thinly developed characters and slow and eventful scenes, while functional in its own right, won't ever measure up to my preferred taste. And that's totally cool. I'm glad it's not the same for others. Either way, The Garden of Words is awesome, and I will never take that away from it. The title of The New Miyazaki is one that Shinkai has scoffed at at every chance, not only because he probably thinks he doesn't measure up to him, but also because his movies are different, and right he is. 
whereas Miyazaki makes fantastical, otherworldly stories that thrive off of imagination, Shinkai's stories are considerably more grounded and limited in scope to tell a more personal tale. But what if Shinkai, even for just one time, wanted to make a product similar to that of Ghibli and Miyazaki? Well, in 2011, he did just that with his third movie, children who chase lost voices. Many have voiced their lack of enthusiasm at the idea of Shinkai trying to do a Miyazaki and call this movie weak and non-genuine, saying Shinkai should just stick to what he does best. Not me though, I love this movie. Coming off of the place promise in our early days and 5cm per second, I was just mesmerized by how alive this movie felt. This movie is beautiful, but it never cuts corners in its animation, which is ever moving and eye candy. The characters are either extremely likable or overly interesting in their morbid way. The emotional scenes hit me like magic trucks, the age rating of the film certainly caught me off guard but nothing too off putting. The simple message the movie was trying to convey was conveyed extraordinarily. I'm not gonna try to say this is a better movie than Garden of Words, I'm just gonna say this movie works for me quite well. The whole movie is essentially a quest for Asuna and her substitute teacher Morisaki on their quest to rescue their loved ones from the dead by going into the world of Agartha. Morisaki is trying to get his wife back while Asuna is trying to rescue Shun, a guy from Agartha who she met before his sudden death. The scenes selling their relationship are few, but are sweet. They drive the point home nicely and don't overstay their welcome. You kinda want him to be alive after all of that. It's in Agartha where most of the fun is present though. It's not like the most creative place in fiction, but it's got a lot going for it. These monsters that can't touch light are nightmare fuel, and the action scenes with them are super intense, while these quatzar quattles are pretty mystical and incredibly curious to see. A bit of frenemy to the people and teacher duo is Shin, brother of Shun, who wants to take them out of Agartha due to a long conflict between the two worlds. I like Shin, he manages to carry everything he's seen and has a heck of a courageous heart, but he half works for me as his motivations are pretty unclear most of the time, and his arc about grieving his brother's death feels kinda dull due to literally never interacting with him on screen. Probably the one thing that pushes this movie away from true masterpiece status. The topic of death is one that is clearly very present in the film. Many characters will speak of the matter in a non-negative way, treating it like a natural part of life, while also respecting life as a blessing bestowed to us that we should learn to appreciate. This is where Morisaki, the teacher, comes in, being stone-headedly decided to bring his wife back to life. In the end, only he decides to do the final step, as Asuna chooses to protect her own life instead of reviving Shun at the cost of it. However, for Morisaki to revive his wife, he needs to take a living human as a vessel, to which he begrudgingly has to choose Asuna. Morisaki, in his refusal to accept death, has chosen to prioritize it over living beings, which Shin, who learned the true value of life, opposes. Asuna says goodbye to Shun as she returns to the world of the living, and Morisaki asks Shin to kill him as he has lost the one thing in life he cared about. But Shin refuses, and Asuna assures him that living is a blessing. For as non-subtle as the movie gets, this ending broke me. For as simple as that lesson was, it was executed in a clean, straightforward and powerful way. I can't pick Garden of Words over this. That movie is smarter, more professional, more tight. But this is just too unapologetically magical, with its wondrous setting, exciting animation, strong characters and delightful message. I think this is Shinkai's most underrated work. You may be better off sticking to your own style, man, but for a first try at something different, I'd say you did quite a great job. <laughs> Weathering With You is Makoto Shinkai's first film after hitting the mainstream, and with that comes a certain set of expectations and pressure both from himself and the people he answers to. He's no longer making some niche product to appeal to a specific group of people, he's leading the Japanese box office. So I feel like Shinkai must have wondered how to preserve this newly found reach while still keeping the integrity of the films he makes. On that note, Weathering With You is easily the most commercially sound film of his. A movie where a girl controls the weather, there's a lot of waterbending powers, visually stunning water animation, and a whole bunch of weird anime crazy situations, not to mention the sudden shift to a more action-oriented climax. But the movie is also grounded in a bustling Tokyo, so it doesn't feel particularly out there like a Ghibli film. It'd be meaningless to pretend I'm not fond of this new style. I think creating cool, exciting and fantastical events in familiar settings is a recipe for a great film. 
but so long as the emotion of the story is still present. That's the one part Shingai had to keep track of the most, and I'm happy to say he succeeded. This movie is, by all means, incredibly emotion-filled. Both protagonists of the film, Hodak and Hina, are incredibly charming characters. They both go through pretty realistic struggles, like working at low-payment jobs or trying to live on their own at a low age, but are also super likable and have much more quirks of their own than most Shinkai protagonists. The secondary characters are probably the strongest on this list too. We've got a lazy, decayed man and his stick-in-the-mud knees, as well as this kid who dates two girls at once. They're flawed, clearly, but the movie lets us know they have values and aspirations too, as they help our protagonists throughout the film and have multiple scenes on their own to show how the events impact them, which I found awesome. The whole plot of the film is that Hina is able to stop Tokyo from raining all the time, and I mean literally all the time. And with that in mind, Hodak and Hina use this power to make people's lives happier and earn some money. Definitely a very selfish motive, but one more believable than that. The movie has a really feel-good, almost contagious tone at first, but as the burdens of their situation start piling up, the movie becomes more and more grim. A giant portion of the movie is spent escaping from the police, and it gets really intense for Hodaka, Hina and her brother. In that aspect, the movie is at times quite messy and unfocused. I think maybe it got too threading for what is essentially three kids running from home. Like, jeez, you really didn't need that many policemen for that. It's probably in this portion of Weathering With You that I was the most conflicted, but it really picks back up soon after. The heart of this movie comes from the moral dilemma Hodaka must face, because as it turns out, for Tokyo to stop raining for the rest of time, Hina must sacrifice herself, which she does without warning while they're escaping. This is good for the city as it's now not raining anymore more, which at that point was getting quite dangerous indeed, but for Hina's close ones, it's devastating. Hodaka does everything in his power to take Hina back, dodging the police and running till his last breath to get to his destination. His boss, Suga, tries to stop him as he thinks he's making him a favor by pulling his life back together. But even he is able to understand that, no matter how that mean may look like, Hodaka is being driven by heart, which he ultimately respects, and makes him want to help Hodaka even against the police. After one of the most breathtaking and cathartic moments in all animation, Hodaka manages to save Hina. Now the city is raining again, and it will do so for the years to come, partially flooding and affecting those living closer to the coast. This is not good, undoubtedly, but the movie makes us understand that the life of one girl isn't less valuable than that. And Hodaka's courageous heart ultimately did the right decision, even if the results were not ideal. He doesn't get off the hook either, as he forced to pay the price by the law for three years and stops seeing Hina. So the reality of weathering with you ends up being one of sacrifice and hardship. Sometimes it's not that we can't fix everything, but that we must do things that actively contribute to breaking them for the greater good. It's no surprise that the ending was somewhat controversial for audiences, which fine, I guess, but I'm obviously standing on the positive side, as I completely feel for the emotions Hodaka was going through. Being a really cute love story with a lot of emotional weight and a bittersweet finale that pushes its characters to their absolute limit, I'm left fascinated by the story told in this film. Shinkai clearly knew that he couldn't stop creating these overly intimate personal stories simply because he was now crossing the 100 million dollar mark, and this movie is shining proof. Weathering With You is a masterpiece, and a pretty perfect way of showing that the future of Shinkai is looking pretty bright. Yeah, you probably knew it'd be your name. I spend a majority of this video singing my praises about most of Shinkai's work, but even I can help to admit that it was never much of a contest, really. Your name is just that good. It's a fun body swap story with crazy shenanigans, while also being an extremely beautiful, touching story about love, life, and the connections we are able to make. It's got gorgeous animation, the two most likable characters on this list, a score by Radwimps that, combined with its striking opening, does absolutely everything right, and an equal amount of moments that'll make you shed a tear as much as ones that'll make you smile from ear to ear with a grandiose sense of happiness. Your name isn't a sad story. It's not interested in depicting the grim areas of life. Your name is, by all means, an optimistic tale, one that convinces us that no matter how unthinkable, how unlikely the link between two people can be, the universe will find a way to make it happen. Because just think for a second how many people are out there in the world just waiting to change your life forever, and imagine you had the chance to get to know them to the extent of living their own life. That seems to be the question your name asks. 
a big what if with the presence of the supernatural. In a sense, your name isn't a love story because these characters don't know each other. They both live in different parts of Tokyo. The entire movie is them trying to get to know each other, and try they do. It starts with a body swap, which is a gateway for both Mitsuha and Taki to live a life they either yearn for or need it all the same. It also gives them an insight into the opposite gender, which should prove quite an impactful one when you're still in your teens. But most important of all, it's a gateway into the relationships made by the other one. Mitsuha gets to relate to this girl Taki has a crush for, even outright helping him start a relationship with her, while Taki gets to join Mitsuha's family and friends as well. So even though Taki and Mitsuha don't know each other, they know what it's like to be in each other's shoes. This is strengthened even more as both start communicating via messages, which leads to damage controlling the body swap events, or each character offering advantages to the other in their own unique way. This part of the movie is just so cute and lovely. Not only does it come with the entertainment of Freaky Friday, but it also immensely builds on the relationships and aspirations. Then the big twist happens. As Taki tries to go and see Mitsuha face to face, he discovers she's been dead for three years, killed by the beautiful shooting star that was ever so present. I find this just unbelievably amazing. Not only is this immense payoff to one of the movie's most stunning visual traits, but it also recontextualizes every event of the movie, as it is now Taki's job to save Mitsuha, and it's been that way all along. It makes no sense, how could you possibly save someone who's already dead? I agree it makes no sense, it's ridiculous, and yet Taki still manages to go back in time. Because these characters don't care about what is possible, all they care about is the link they have between each other, which defeats any place or time that may separate them. This isn't even a fluke on the writer's part, the concept of an eternal bond is very well explained early on. The third act, where both Taki and Mitsuha try to evacuate the town, is fairly standard, but effective, with both rising tension, activeness from the supportive cast, and a whole bunch of loose ends being tied up. The most important thing, however, is this gorgeous, unforgettable scene where both teens finally reunite. It's awkward, it's unexpected, but it's beautiful nonetheless, only for it to be ripped from us when the character's connection gets cut off, and they both start forgetting the other's existence. This is so heartbreaking. Even if the town gets safe from the meteor, which it does, obviously, the stakes of the main duo just forgetting about each other feels really tragic after everything they've been through. Your name lingers on this fact over and over, putting us in a long, long time jump where Mitsu and Taki are constantly about to meet again, only for it not to happen. You begin to wonder if this will be just like any other Shinkai film, you start losing hope, you're mentally preparing yourself for it not to happen, and then... <laughs> beautiful. Just beautiful. Taki and Mitsuha finally get to know each other, we don't know if they'll end up together, we don't know if they'll break up two weeks later once they do, but we do know they finally got the chance to know each other because the bond they share is that strong. It wasn't destiny what took them there, it was the teens' own desire to know the one they shared bodies with that led them there. It was their struggle, their aspiration, or their foolish understanding of love that got them there. They may not have done enough, they may have taken too long, but it doesn't matter now because now they can see each other and ask. <laughs> Do I think this movie is perfect? Uh, almost, really. I can't even bring up some devastating point about it. Just a couple nitpicks here and there with some ideas as to how certain things could have been done better. But why bother with that when one of the most captivating films ever made is right there for me to cash over? Your name stands above the crowd of excellence because I watched it literally four months ago. It's not some age-old classic or a few years old favorite of mine. It's a film that is as earth-shatteringly important to me as it is recent. Thanks to your name, I started picking up some anime movies again. I watched all the other movies on this list thanks to your name. As you can imagine, I saw all of them in pretty close succession. This isn't nostalgia biasing, even though no shingle film I saw after your name measured up, I will be eternally grateful to this film for introducing me to all the others, reintroducing me to anime, and for being one of my favorite films of all time. I hope you've enjoyed my ramblings. Because there were only six movies to cover, I could flesh out my thoughts considerably more than otherwise. There's still a lot I wish I could say about this, but I'm satisfied nonetheless. Now, as for what the future holds for us, we know that in 2022 a new Shingle film is coming over, and I'm unbelievably excited for it. As long as I'm assured, of course, that the movie does premiere in my country. Hopefully, it will be on the level of some of my favorite Shingai films. And who knows, maybe it offers something new to the table that we haven't seen from the guy. Either way, I'm really excited, and I hope you can let me talk about it when it comes out. This is Under Galaxy, and I'll see you some other time.